welcome everyone to the Social Liberal Forum event, Rising to the Climate Challenge. My name is Duncan Brack. I've been asked to chair this evening's discussion. Um, I'm a member of the party's Federal Policy Committee, and in 2018-2019, uh, I chaired the working group that produced the party's latest policy paper on climate change. And going back 10 years, I was a special advisor um, to Chris Hewn at the Department of Energy and Climate Change when we were in government uh, for two years. Um, and we are going to have a really interesting discussion uh, this evening with two speakers. Uh, I'm going to ask them to speak one after the other, and then we'll open up the uh, event to questions from the audience. Uh, but before we invite them to speak, I'm just going to ask Andy to explain how the question and answer function works. Thanks, Duncan, and, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, just, just a little later on in the session, we'll be doing a, a live Q&A. So we'll be drawing on your questions. If you've been to a Social Liberal Forum event before, it'll be, be very similar to that. But just to cover it for anyone else, um, you should be able to see a Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. So please open that now. Uh, it might be at the top or the side, depending on what, what platform or iPad or whatever you're on. Um, we'll be using this, not the chat, for the, for the Q&A. So, so make sure you put your questions in there. Um, though if you'd like to sort of do the equivalent of whispering to someone next to you, then you can use the chat for that. Um, you can submit your questions anytime. So if you've, if, you, if you've come here knowing, knowing exactly what question you're going to ask, then you can put that in now. Um, or obviously, uh, as, as Jane and Edward are, are talking as well, um, and throughout the Q&A. Um, don't be shy. We'd love to hear from everyone. Um, so, so yeah, and also make sure you update, uh, upvote pe other people's questions so that we can sort of see which ones are more popular and that'll, that'll make them more likely to be asked. Um, try to keep them brief uh, and they're more likely to be voted up and also kind of more more, more likely to be answered in interest, interesting ways as well. Um, and uh, and just to say, yeah, I'll draw draw on a, on a, uh, from the questions based on a combination of those votes uh, and an effort to hear from a diversity of voices and, uh, and just to keep the flow of the conversation as well. So sometimes questions may not be asked if they're very similar to a question that has already been covered, um, but so just bear that in mind as well. Um, if you ask a question, then keep the Q&A box open and, 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 uh, and have a look at the chat as well. Um, I will message you privately through the chat to let you know that I'm going to ask you to speak. So when I do that, I'll ask you to raise your hand and keep that hand raised. So it's the, the virtual hand that you should see on the bottom of the screen as well. Uh, keep that raised and then I'll invite you into the room to ask your question uh, soon after that as well. Um, so yeah, just to say, I'll probably maybe do a quick summary of this at the start of the q a but yeah look forward to hearing from jane and edward and, and, uh, and speaking to some of you later on great thanks very much andy okay let's get underway with our two speakers so we're going to start with ed robinson first of all um edward is an environmental consultant and researcher he's worked for the uk think tank green alliance for accenture strategy and for the european climate foundation and um, in terms of the party, he was one of the team that produced the report that Lynn Featherstone uh, commissioned when she was the party's climate spokesperson um, that helped convince us that reaching net zero emissions was a possible, incredible, uh, though challenging uh, target. And that underpinned a lot of the work we then went on to do in a bit more detail in the policy proposals in the party's climate change paper two years ago. So, Edward, over to you. Well, thanks, Duncan, and thanks very much to the SLF. It's um, it's great to be here and being involved with another Social Liberal Forum event. And thank you to, um, I don't know if he's on, but to Paul Hindley for commissioning the uh, the essay that led to this report, which has led to this talk, and to Chris Wilmore for organising this event, uh, and to Andy and Duncan, of course, for hosting it. And I look forward to hearing what Chain says afterwards. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have a very short, don't worry, a very short um, PowerPoint presentation. I know everyone sees too many of them, but um, I'll try to whiz through it. And I hope it's fa fairly sort of self-explanatory and um, and quite easy to follow. Uh, so hopefully this will work. Um, <clears throat> I hope that's worked. Um, yep. And I'll just um, go through this presentation now. So um, <clears throat> this this essay, um, which is called the Menace of Climate Change. Essentially, um, I, I've written on the basis of defending three uh, sort of theses, if you will. So uh, they are these, um, and, it, and, it, and it comes out of aspects of the work that I have done, both in my professional work, but also in the, uh, the work that I've done with Duncan and others around the climate group, with the climate, the working group for the, uh, for the Lib Dems and for others. So my theses are these. Um, first, that we are now, over-reliant on markets and the profit motive and prey to vested interests to deliver our uh, climate change ambitions up to 2050. 
Secondly, we're avoiding hard choices by being unrealistic about breakthrough technology. And this is something that I've become increasingly concerned about. <clears throat> Thirdly, we have too neoclassical in our liberalism, something I know that social liberal forum members are interested in. And that is to say that I don't think we're doing enough to back current technology at the same time as we're not imagining radical social alternatives to the challenges we face in terms of endpoints for society. And I'll speak a bit more about these. I think it's important though to highlight, and I know lots of people are aware of this, just how serious the crisis that we face is and the, the sort of scale of the emergency we're in. Um, so um, you know that uh, the uh, United Nations Environment Programme uh, is now saying that we need about 8% year on year falls in emissions every year globally to stay anywhere near the 1.5 degree target for rise for, for, for global warming by the end of the century. Um, and just to put that into context, um, we know that um, we have to do that at the same time as protecting biodiversity. So there are a million species at risk, reducing our raw material footprints. And these have gone up from 43 to 92 billion metric tons in the last 30 odd years. They've, they've more than doubled. Um, and we have to improve health and well-being for everyone on the planet. And I've just put here that air pollution is killing around 8 million people per year. So it's a pandemic of its own kind. And I know Jane is going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, but to put that into context, 7.7% year fall in emissions globally is about what they estimate the falls were owing to COVID lockdowns across the world last year. So we need that every year, year on year. So this is a global picture, but it is incredibly difficult to try to do that. So the crisis is, is very, very serious, as, as we all know. And it leads me to this question. Um, was Marx right um, in his proposition that we need a full on revolution in order to achieve the kinds of changes that he was talking about, which are not climate change, but other, other, other social um, ends? I argue no in the report. And I argue that rather than needing a revolution to allow existing technology to overcome a crisis, which is what I understand most Marxists suggest, what we in fact need is creative social thinking to enable us to live differently, as we do not yet have the technology we need to carry on as we are. So it's a different set of problems. Um, but I also argue um, in this essay that I'm worried that we've fallen into what I'm describing as a kind of God's plan trap, which is um, God's plan being the agency that planned the entire economy in the Soviet Union, but not terribly successfully, as we know. And I mean that in the sense that we have now, in some senses, got an almost unquestioned faith in savior technology, alongside an unwillingness to acknowledge the depth of the real world crisis. And I'm not saying we, meaning necessarily the group that put together the uh, the party, the Lib Dems um, policy positions, but I mean as the way we talk about climate as a society, not just in Britain, but actually beyond Britain as well, in the, in the developed world especially. Um, but if I'm saying that on the one hand, I don't agree with Marx that we need a revolution, do I think green capitalism is working? And I argue, no, it isn't. Um, and, I, and I go through this in, 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 the, in, the, in the essay a bit. So, just to give a couple of points there, and I, and I fleshed this out a bit in the, in, in the report, just to take the, the analysis that's been done by Energy Policy Tracker on the stimulus packages to, re, to recover from COVID last year, if we're looking at where those were spent, 210 billion, they estimate, went on unconditional fossil fuels. And this is OECD countries, so rich world countries, all of whom members of the Paris Agreement or are now, now the US has rejoined. Only 49 billion went on unconditional clean energy. There are quite a lot of sections of the stimulus that could have been either or both, but in terms of the unconditional commitment of spending, this is quite a radical um, finding. And it shows that we're not on track, that the mindset isn't there to, to, put us on, to put us on track from government in the rich world that have committed to the 1.5 degree Paris target. And if you look on the right, the pie chart rather speaks for itself. It's from International Energy Agency figures, so hardly. Um, a, a sort of green think tank, if you will. And that simply shows, as you can see, that private sector investment in the oil and gas industry, in terms of capital spending, i.e. on projects with probably decades-long horizons and lifetimes, 
renewables and CCS carbon capture spending is, 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 is dwarfed by fossil fuel um, infrastructure spending. And that, there's a picture across the EU, which is very similar to that, which I, which I set out in the report. Um, equally, if you look at um, the valuation of, of clean energy companies, you, you know, you're hard pressed to see that there's been a turning point. I mean, you can see this is a graph from uh, uh, an exchange tra traded fund, a very popular one um, run by BlackRock on uh, clean energy. So it invests in global clean energy companies. And yes, of course, we can see in 2020 that there has been a significant uptick, but it's now coming down again, but it's nowhere near where it was over a decade ago in 2008 before the financial crisis. If you'd invested in clean energy in the biggest clean energy company firms in, in the world in 2008, you'd, be, you'd still have lost a good deal of your money at this stage in the game. This is not how you'd expect the last decade to have been. And that's not to say there haven't been huge strides in technology, particularly in renewable energy. There have been colossal strides there, and I do not deny that. We need to keep moving in this area. But I'm saying that the signals that investors are getting from, so to speak, green capitalism are nothing like what we sometimes imagine they may be. My, 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 my other thesis is around breakthrough technologies. This is a graph that's actually brought out from the, uh, the work done at Cambridge University on um, what's described as absolute zero, a report they produced in 2019. Julian Allwood led the, the research. This is a, this is a reasonably un uncontroversial aspect of that report, and it's, it shows the length of time it takes for a technology, and these are energy technologies, common ones now, to go from um, invention development and demonstration uh, to full scale growth in the economy, as in market commercialization, and then to a point where they can start to grow in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of more linear fashion across the economy. So you can keep adding capacity every, every year. And it shows how long it takes. So when we're talking about um, what I describe as breakthrough technologies, i.e. technologies that are not currently commercially available, but have been proven to work in either laboratory or, or in some cases, dem full scale demonstration. When we're talking about rolling them out across the entire economy, we have to realize how long it will take. And then we can start to see how ambitious we've been, how genuinely on an engineering level, how ambitious we're being. Sometimes I'm, I'm arguing unrealistic. Let's take the case of carbon capture and storage, um, which is a, a technology, and many of you will be familiar with it, which intends to, in different, with, via different routes, chemical and engineering, to, to, to actually strip out the, the emissions from processes, so either energy or industrial, and store them. Um, <clears throat> the global operational CCS capacity at the moment in the power sector, and there's none beyond the power sector, is, is 2.4 megatons of CO2 per year in terms of capture. In Europe, there's a, there's a capacity to capture around 1.7 megatons of CO2 a year. Um, and this is not necessarily... Um, um, this is not necessarily capturing 100% of the emissions that, that, that you would uh, expect, them, expect it to. So there is a problem with capture rates. But anyway, so, and in the UK, we have zero capacity at the moment. Um, but the scenarios, for a global scenario for the IEA, they're talking about, this is their sustainable development scenario, they're talking about 310 megatons of CO2 captured by CCS by 2030. The CCC in the UK is talking about, um, well, it's, it's 75 um, to 175 megatons of CO2 per year by 2050, and potentially 27 megatons of CO2 per year online by 2030. So there's none at the moment. And if you see this graph on the left, it speaks for itself. It can take some as 30 to 40 years to go from demonstration to full-scale deployment. So we're talking about something which is you know, speculative to some, to some extent. Not to say the technology doesn't work, I believe it does work. It's a question of scale and, and, and speed at which we can deploy it. So I've said in this paper that, well, it's not a paper, sorry, this report, um, that I think we should have a slightly different mindset around how we approach this. If we're a bit more cautious, actually, about what technology can do, we might nonetheless find that there is a significant role for the private sector, provided the public sector gets a bit more firmly behind the, the, the technologies that currently exist. And if we think carefully about how we can manage our demand to reduce it quite radically, at least in the horizon of the next 20 years, and potentially up to 2050 as well, 
when we can then start after 2050, perhaps, to really seriously deploying some of those technologies. If we think more creatively about it, we might find that we can actually design potentially in the time allowed, which is still 20 to 30 years, 20, you know, 30 years up to 2050, better societies that demand a great deal less energy and less resources and still improve our lives. The Lib Dem paper, to some extent, does go quite a long way towards doing that, but I think we need to go even further, and I'll, perhaps we can discuss some of that in the, in, in, in the session that follows. Examples, and some of these are quite radical, but I am saying we do require an even more radical set of, 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 of ideas than we've currently got. We talk about um, phasing out petrol and diesel cars and replacing them with EVs, um, sorry, electric vehicles and electric cars. We could, for example, stop, stop thinking that way and start thinking about phasing all cars in cities out, um, provided we can uh, cater for freight and, and people with disabilities, et cetera. Um, and, and perhaps we could institute free public transport there. We could do that at the same time as we offer potentially zero carbon apartments for all, plus district heat networks or, heat ne or, 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 or other forms of district heat. And we could look to personalized diets and urban farms to uh, reduce emissions very radically and improve health in uh, the food and uh, agriculture sector. We may have to look at banning beef and lamb because these are two extremely high emitting um, ruminant um, sources of food. Um, we didn't go as far as that in the, in, the, um, in the policy paper that was put to the, the conference, but I'm suggesting now we may to reconsider that. Um, I think there is a very serious possibility that there isn't a viable low carbon shipping uh, technology that's likely to come online um, in the scale required before 2050. So that may mean that we have to very seriously consider onshoring and insourcing and basically pausing international freight for a period of time. That would of course radically change the way we consume, but it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be unknown to us, as to, to a wealthy society, to go back to a certain level of that. It gets us into some good, big questions, I realise. Um, there, we may have to consider fully banning most aeroplane fly, uh, flying after 2025 or around 2030, and perhaps investing instead in a European sleeper train network, which there is some discussion of at the European Union level at the moment. Um, in terms of putting um, public money fully at the service of um, current technology, I'm suggesting that there is now time to, to really set up a fully government-backed low-carbon steel cement chemicals company, either one or three, and we could look to give equity to that uh, in that company or those three companies, so all British citizens, so they have a stake in it. But these are technologies that will take 20 to 30 years to come to fruition, but we're not doing enough at the moment, so um, we need to put, they are natural monopolies, they, they will not be driven by the profit uh, motive. The margins will simply be too low. So I think we need to have a, a government, a fully, fully capitalized government um, organization and, and company there to do those things. And lastly, potentially talking about the Mark Carney idea of for, forward guidance here, we could um, look to give guidance on a carbon price that would, that would rise very radically to 200 pounds per ton and then beyond. And there's actually been a suggestion by the Norwegian government to how they might do that in the years that come. Um, the, 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 as, as people say, the, the problem with carbon taxation or carbon pricing when you're trying to get to net to zero carbon emissions is that you have to put it up to an almost infinite amount. So it, it starts to lose its salience, but we need to talk about raising it. Um, these are all things we could do over 20 year horizons or 30 year horizons. So it, it's not a question. They, they are, I argue, we can get into this in discussion. They are less ambitious than the alternative, which is to look to the technology to do it. They are more realistic. Um, Finally, I finished on a very, um, a very um, famous and probably very well regarded, well known photo from the German government planning office in around the turn of the century, simply saying that 60 people and road space and the um, what what cities could look like if we if they're arranged by different modes. I think this is the kind of thing that doesn't really show up in an Excel spreadsheet when you're looking at megatons this and megatons that. It requires a different set of thinking. Um, how you might design a city this way. So um, that's a little bit longer than I was planning to speak for, um, but um, I'm very much looking forward to Jane's uh, comments because she's uh, very, very knowledgeable in, her, in, in, in a lot of these areas and perhaps Duncan's as well and to yours. So I'll, I'll stop there.
And I'll stop sharing my, sh my screen and um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll hear from Jane. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed, Ed. Um, it was a great introduction. And for people who want to read a bit more about it, um, Ed's booklet, The Menace of Climate Change, is available now for download on the SLF website. So um, let's go. Um, I can see quite a few questions coming in already. That's good. So keep them coming. Um, but um, let's go now to our second speaker, Jane Burston, who runs the Clean Air Fund, a global philanthropic initiative that supports organisations around the world working to combat outdoor air pollution, improve human health and address climate change. And before that, um, Jane has a background in UK government and was head of climate and energy science there. Um, clean air is often sort of tends to be a bit forgotten about when we concentrate much on climate change. So, um, Jane, very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you. Thanks, Duncan. Um, and thanks for the introduction. I mean, the the my background is, I think, the reason that I was asked to speak at this event, because, as Duncan said, I worked in the climate change field for more than 15 years and then recently moved to focus on um, reducing air pollution, which, as, as we'll hear, are uh, not distinct things. And um, so I was asked to talk about why I made the switch and, and how those two different agendas come together. Um, so wh why did I make the switch? Well, three about three years ago today, I was, um, as Duncan said, in the middle of a secondment to the British government um, as head of climate science. And while I was there, I, um, I discovered a couple of facts that led me to, to where I am today. One of them is um, the results of a survey on at public attitudes to, to climate change. So Bayes runs uh, an annual survey about you know, what are people doing about and how much do they care about climate change. And um, what surprised me about that survey, and I now know that this is true of many Western countries, is that the vast majority of the British public are say that they're somewhat or very concerned about climate change. And that fact has been true for more than a decade, and it's pretty stable. So more than two thirds of people say that they have done for ages, regardless of you know, wh whether or not the subject has come and gone in the media. Um, and I found that surprising. And the reason that I found it surprising was the second fact, which was hammered home to me whilst in government, which was that people don't tend, ha haven't tended to date to necessarily translate those concerns into actions. And so with UK emissions, for example, uh, the UK has done a really good job of decarbonising. Um, because we've done a good job of decarbonising the power sector, that's something that, that government can, can have a, a lot of control over and doesn't require a lot of people to switch to renewable energy tariffs. Uh, there's lots of other mechanisms for getting there. Whereas for decarbonising sectors like transport, it's going to need some behaviour change. Um, and that's where, where, where things have stumbled. So, I mean, I already knew that from my experience. Um, I, I'd been working, I was on the comment from the National Physical Laboratory where I'd been running um, a department on climate change. And I'd regularly been doing talks on climate change and the buzz in the room when I did talks on air quality versus climate change was just quite different. Um, I think with air quality, people were much more engaged. It related to their lives a lot more and their concerns. So, um, I mean, that's it's those collection of things that have, have led me to focus on climate change. The fact that the cause to, to focus on air pollution, the fact that the causes of climate change are very often the same as the causes of air pollution, uh, mostly burning fossil fuels, um, which produces two thirds of air pollution. And that means that the solutions can also be the same. And if people, if what we need now is a fund fundamental shift in kind of public attitudes and a focus really on what people want to change um, in their lives, then I think uh, air pollution provides a very good way into those conversations um, and a good angle for those policies. Um, I think unlike climate change, air pollution is often urgent in a way that people can easily understand and almost everybody is affected um the world health organization says but uh, nine out of ten of us are breathing air that's harmful to our health 
Um, and also air pollution isn't politically as politically divisive. Um, so political parties of all stripes are more prepared to do something about it around the world than necessarily they um, have been about climate change. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of why I uh, switched my focus, but I, I, I don't really see it as a, a switch in 100% um, switch in topic because the solutions are largely the same. Um, you've probably all heard um, about the story of Ella Kissy Deborah, who is um, at the time her mother Rosamond was fighting to get the inquest into her death reopened. I didn't know it at the time. I uh, know Rosamond well now and I'm very familiar with her case and her cause. And for those of you who don't know, um, Ella died when she was nine years old from an asthma attack. Um, she and her family lived on the south or just close to the south circular and went to school uh, also near the south circular and she suffered from um, from, from a, a very severe type of asthma that meant that during the last three years of her life she was hospitalized almost once per month and what a court has just found at the end of last year is that the causes of most of those um, hospitalizations were air, was the air pollution on the road by her house. So the coroner for the first time we think in the world has recorded air pollution as a cause of death on Ella's death certificate. And, um, you know, this isn't every, this is the first person to have air pollution kind of listed as a cause of death, but it is by no means the first person to have died from air pollution. Um, in fact, families like Ella's are suffering all around the world in very large numbers. Um, the World Health Organization attributes 15% of all deaths to air pollution, and that number's going up. So for me, the, the rationale for working on the solutions to climate change that are also solutions to air pollution is there's just this huge win-win um, for implementing things that both that tackle both things at once and a bunch of other things too, um, economic benefits, equalities, and also surprisingly, air pollution can have quite a big impact in ways that uh, I wasn't hitherto aware of on children's education. Um, so that's, you know, that's the that's the picture of, um, of of the health impacts. I mean, moving on to the solutions, I think that uh, my my major point of kind of philosophical departure with Edward is that I think that we do have many of the techno technological solutions that we need. Um, and I think it's much more of a policy gap than a technical gap. So the you know the, the chart that Edward showed from Cambridge, those those solutions have been being developed for 40 years and therefore are commercially available and are being rolled out at, at scale in the case of most of them. Um, where you know, just to get tangible about what we have and don't have technology-wise, I think fully commercialized and um, at scale are what we need, well, and, and be beginning to be at scale are what we need on power generation. Um, to ele electricity generation from renewables, um, energy storage, transport of people, you know, rail travel has been around for a while, electric vehicles are now uh, commercially available, uh, such due to the extent that governments have uh, even targeted the um, phase out of combustion engines in many countries. And we have quite a lot of what we need on buildings, so lighting, uh, data, energy efficiency and heat. Um, and in development is a lot of the rest. So it's not that we don't know what we what we want to do. The research is there um, and often pilots on hydrogen, smart grids, industrial decarbonisation and aviation and shipping. I think the major missing piece is carbon capture and storage. Um, but I also think we ought not to forget that solutions don't necessarily involve technology at all some of the time. Um, you know, walking or cycling, for example, instead of driving is often overlooked because there isn't an industry lobby pushing it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's something that could reduce significantly our emissions. Um, so the, yeah, the lesson for me on the technology front isn't more caution, it's actually that we need to accelerate the, the research on areas that are missing, like um, carbon capture for heavy industry. 
Um, and that we also need to focus on the policy because much harder than getting the right technology is getting it adopted. I think that's where a lot of things falter. And I think that's where we are faltering at the moment on the technologies that require behavior change to adopt them like um, transport and heat in particular. Um, which just to finish off brings us back to air quality. Um, and to summarize, I think we're in the UK, we're at the point of decarbonization where we do need, uh, it's not about choice editing anymore. We do need people's permission. Um, and most people do care about climate change. They're not being disingenuous when they go on these marches. They're not being disingenuous when they answer this survey. Um, but people are more mo motivated on a day-to-day -day basis in their decision-making by other things. And we need to recognize that and make the right choices easy for them or compelling for them in terms that they care about, like their health and their family's health. So I think if we work on actions that reduce both greenhouse gases and air pollution, which is uh, most things, but by no means not everything, um, that we can and will save literally millions of lives and simultaneously address climate change and inequalities and um, improve educational outcomes at the same time. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks very much indeed, Jane. Um, so Andy, do you just want to remind people briefly about the question and answer function and then we'll start taking them? Yeah, for anyone who sort of joined and, and, and missed the missed the first bit, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking questions from the Q&A box, uh, so there's quite a lot in there already, and I'm sort of speaking to people, um, getting people ready to uh, come in and ask their questions live. Um, if anyone would prefer to not ask their question live, then when I message you, then you can just let me know, um, and me or Duncan can, can read out the question as well. Um, but yeah, just make sure you keep having a look, upvote any questions you, you really like, and yeah, look forward to hearing from Jane and Edward uh, on the answers. That's great, thanks. And we're going to probably group questions in twos or threes because we have quite a few of them. Um, so I'm going to use my privilege as chair to ask the first one and then we'll take a question from Graham Riley. Um, so my, my question is to both of you, we're talking about quite a lot of things needing to be done, whether it's the adoption of technology or it's driving behavioural change or it's setting more ambitious targets and so on. Do you think, um, what would you, what reforms would you think are necessary to the institutions and structures of government uh, in the UK to be able to drive all that? So hold on to that. And now I'll introduce Graham Riley to, uh, if he's able to, or I can read out his question. Should be joining now. Graham, uh, switch on your camera and please ask. Uh, I think it just takes a second to come through. Great, yeah. Graham, over to you. One second, just come off you. Uh, thank you. Um, Edward had some great examples, I think, of the, the mindset shifts that needed, uh, but they seem that they're going to require major societal change. Now, I know Jane touched upon this a little bit, but given the current challenges in national politics and global politics, how can we actually practically enable this to happen in the, in the limited time uh, available? What are the real things that we could all be doing right now to make some of that change happen? Great. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Jane, do you want to deal with those two questions? Uh, yes, sure. So taking that last one first, um, mindset shift. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I guess kind of kind of where I'm coming from is meet people where they are on um, uh, and where they're motivated. So um, for a lot of the people that we work with, they're concerned about their, and we fund projects to reduce air pollution um, globally. They're concerned about their children's health in particular. And also when we work with mayors, I think that they find the health arguments a lot more, that resonate a lot more with the general public. Um, it's a lot easier to introduce a policy explaining how, how many fewer deaths there will be in your city as a consequence and how many fewer asthma cases. Like I saw there was a question about the Bath Clean Air Zone. Uh, they've cited how many asthma cases there are in Bath and we, we know that many of those will have been caused by air pollution in the first place and um, they air pollution exacerbates asthma once you've got it however you've got it so local leaders I think often find it easier to couch things it or more it resonates more to couch things in health terms than talking about climate change where it sounds like the bet when it's true that the benefit is much more distributed and the pain is local. If the pain is local and the and the benefits are local, I think it's a lot 
easier. Um, on the question about um, what would need to change about the kind of government infrastructure, I think uh, I would suggest three things. Um, one, well, something that I'm noticing more and more is the lack of how the lack of cross government working in central government is holding things back. Um, so again, just to use air pollution as an example, it's owned by DEFRA. Um, it's the, the policy solutions are owned by Bayes and uh, Department of Transport and probably a few others. The costs and the, the kind of health burden is uh, Department of Health and Social Care and then the Treasury holds the purse strings. Um, barely any of them are working together. Uh, the DFT and DEFRA have formed a joint air quality unit on clean air zones in particular, but it's very niche. So I think number one would be a better way of having cross departmental um, ownership of particular issues, especially where the cost uh, lies in one department and the benefit uh, or pol policy solution in another. I think second thing, um, we're seeing that city leaders on climate and other environmental issues are prepared to be much more ambitious sometimes than national government, but they lack the powers in some respect to, to do what they need. So I think we would need to look at local government powers. And then I think thirdly, and this also goes to Graham's question again, kind of the, the deliberative democracy processes that have happened, including the, the one that uh, was recently run on climate change, just to me really um, uh, seem an incredible way of kind of getting people to understand the evidence and come up with much more ambitious solutions and go much further than the government ever would have thought they would have had permission for from, from the general public. And we saw in Ireland uh, when they when they used deliberative democracy around the um, the abortion referendum that actually once given the power the nation does pay attention and uh, you know similar similar results that pe people take the evidence and um, and make good choices on the back of it. So I think to both questions, I think more de deliberative democracy would be very useful. Great, thanks very much, Ed. Um, interesting, very interesting questions, and, and I, I must say, I certainly agree with Jane about um, a that it makes a lot of sense to to get people involved on a on a level with which you can actually do things, and especially on an area like air pollution where they're already causing a lot of people terrible pain, and in some cases, in some very sad cases, death. Um, and it and it does actually enable you to be able to do things. I think connected to that, and, and Jane was going was, was, was going into this. I, I would like to agree that I think in terms of the Duncan's question on, on governmental machinery of government style questions or institutions. I mean, I really do think um, local governments should be properly funded and brought back into almost an executive role in the in the British state again. I mean, for example, we put in that po uh, climate policy paper um, an emergency house um, retrofitting and low carbon scheme, which I think was a really a good piece of policy. That should be delivered 100% by local authorities and they should be given money and they should be given the, the capacity to borrow money at government rates, you know, to do it. I, I think they should be given the, the full control over, over whether that be mayors or district councils, or county councils or whatever, wherever the right structure is, and they should be allowed to run with it. Um, you know, and, and, and they should be absolutely designing the policy and delivering it and people should understand that it's not central government doing it. You know, they could they, if they choose to set up their own house building agencies, they should be able to do that. If they want to be, if they want to set up a heat pump company, they should be able to do that, and they should have the funding to do that. Um, I think the departmentalitis that goes on in Whitehall prevents that, as well as a culture of centralisation that Britain, I feel, is particularly you know wedded to, um, and possibly the fact that there's a bit of partisanship going on as well. But you could break that down a bit. Um, on the second one. Uh, the big change is how do we do it? We're liberals. We don't want to force people into it. Um, someone has put on the chat participatory democracy, and I agree. I also, as part of that, um, and I think James touched on this, as, uh, to go even further, I would say economic democracy. And I, I think that, that the report that people have, have linked to um, Citizens Britain goes into some, some level of detail on this. But I, I think for, you know, how you might tackle a big challenge, so, you know, 
take, for example, um, one of my technologies, which I would call a breakthrough technology now, which is, say, for example, low, zero carbon flight. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's just about in demonstration. It's, it's nowhere near, you know, there's one, one solar plane has gone around the world, but, you know, you know, really, we are miles off zero carbon flight, and we all know it, right? We're, we're probably 40, maybe 50 years off. We, we, we might not be, but in terms of everyone taking the same level of flying hours, zero carbon. So a way of doing that could be to say, right, we're, we're serious about these targets. We're going to have to either very seriously restrict and then go down to no flying. We'll try and match that with investment in, um, in rail, et cetera, sleeper trains or whatever. Um, but we'll have an aviation company and everyone will, have a, 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 everyone will have a stake in it. Everyone will have a share in it. We'll say to people, you know, you're not going to get anything out of this for a couple of decades. But if this works and we can fly again and we sell this technology, you're going to all, all of us will we'll make a lot of money off it, a sovereign wealth style program. And we say to them, until this technology works, when we're not, neither are we flying nor are we making money out of this. But if it does work, and we can have potentially several companies doing it, you know, I, I think it's a way to bring people in a bit by giving them a sort of stake in the problem, as in preserve the health of the planet, but also a stake in the solution. And it keeps them serious and it keeps them honest about how lightly are they actually going to get, is this thing going to come through? And it, it stops politicians and others not necessarily lying, but perhaps taking easy options out where they're saying this technology will be here sooner than we, we actually think it will. So that would be an answer for me. And I, I always like the idea. I know um, SLF people often do about giving people financial stakes in, 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 in government programs rather than running, running it through a monolith. Um, so those would be my answers, but they're just beginning answers. <clears throat> Pretty big questions. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Graham, for your question. Um, we've got a couple of other questions. I think, Andy, you're going to read them out. Yeah. Uh, first question is from Neil. Uh, he said, uh, Liberal Democrats like to make evidence-based policy. How reliable do you think current data is, or can we expect more greenwashing to hide real emission levels? And we also have a question from Kevin, who asked, uh, do you see a role for the UK in developing the international conversation about carbon reduction? If so, what and how? And I'm just going to uh, put Kevin back into the main <laughs> into the main uh, uh, participant area. <laughs> Sorry, that's the. Uh, there you go. Cool. Give you a little thinking time. Okay, Ed. Do you want to go first? Um, I'll take those in in the order they were asked. Um, uh, so it's Kevin's question on uh, on greenwash. Yeah, I think greenwash is an increasing problem. I mean, whether it necessarily um, is, is is causing major problems for our um, for our data gathering, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, um, I, I do think though there's there's a big problem with double counting, and you know, lo lots of companies are announcing um, net zero plans and are including quite a lot of offsets in them. Some companies have announced they're not going to include it, uh, offsets in there but we know there's problems in the offset market uh, you know it, it's not uh, in my view it's not really a very um it's not a very honest way to, to to produce a net zero strategy is to focus too much on the net and so much less on the zero i'm a bit skeptical about net zero as a concept in its entirety i, I understand that we're not going to be able to get to zero carbon emissions and that we should therefore have carbon removal but i think doing that um through the corporate Sort of, you know, with carbon credits, etc., is is possible a door to serious abuse. Um, on the second question, I mean, carbon reduction in the UK. I don't know if you mean carbon removal or I, I use negative, what some of the as negative emissions, uh, um, or whether you mean um, just basically cutting our carbon emissions. The way uh, I read it, it was just generally climate ambition. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I, on either um, front, but particularly on that one, then, then yes, you know, Britain has a has a big role to play. I mean, we've got a, a huge stage uh, on which to play it, uh, given that it's going to be in Glasgow in November. It's a, a bit of a, a sore point that it happens to be Boris Johnson that's going to have to um, put himself front and centre in doing it. But um, there you are, that's what we've got. Um, I mean, yes, I mean, the, the work that people, two of them on this, on this screen in front of me now, have done in, in, in putting climate policy, um, Britain at the forefront of it, globally that setting up the committee on climate change and having the carbon budgets and a rigor i can disagree with some aspects of the ambition that the ccc that's the committee on climate change has 
but I don't disagree with their um, yeah, their, their honest brokers that are at the cutting edge of, of pathway and scenario analysis, and it's brilliant to have them there. Um, you know, uh, so I think we've got a big role to play. I'm very much hoping we're going to have a very ambitious, but realistic, but ambitious um, nationally determined commitment submission. We're outside of the European Union now, so, you know, uh, regrettably, but I suppose that does give us some, it makes it different for us when we submit our commitments. Um, so I'm hoping we're going to have a, a strong one. And we look forward to the US one as well, but we shouldn't be um, too led by the US. I mean, one, one of the things, sorry, I was just turning into a long answer, but one of the things I'd like to, I am a bit worried that um, there's now a little bit of focus on uh, carbon border adjustments. That is, if you have a carbon tax in one place and another country doesn't, do you, do you put a tariff on effectively? The US has sort of come out and said, um, subsequent to Biden being elected, that they're, a bit, they're, they're, they're not sure about this, they're worried about this. I don't know. I mean, I we're currently setting up our new emissions trading system and I think it would give us a I maybe others will disagree but I think it gives us a chance to actually potentially start doing this kind of thing putting on tariffs for for example steel if it's not you know being produced low carbon and ours is that doesn't necessarily have to be just straight up protection if it's being done as protection that's not right but if it's being done for climate purposes then I think it can be right and so we, we could start the debate there but um I, I have to say I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical we will but you know, hopefully we will. Okay, thanks very much. Jane. Um, yeah, so on the greenwash question, it, yeah, it, to the extent that that was about do we have the right data to understand the UK's emissions, I think uh, we do. Um, and globally, we do as well. You know, we can, the, the check is how much uh, the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and, um, and we're always going to be able to measure that. Um, and calculating countries' emissions using their inventories is a very accurate process. Um, I think, though, the, the reason that um, uh, Edward and I, having both worked in this sector, can, can disagree on the how far a technology is along question is you can really find data points on many other things to back up whatever argument you would like to um, to come up with. So I think, you know, the, the I, I would argue with Edward's pie chart about investment in, um, in renewables because it was investment from the oil and gas sector. I could equally have come up with a pie chart, probably from the IEA as well, uh, about investment from different sources into the renewable sector that had, uh, you know, almost a, the, the percentages flipped. So I think it can get quite confusing because of the many data sources and different ways of looking at the problem. Um, and you know, that maybe makes it harder to make choices. On the role for the UK, yeah, I think um, we have had and hopefully will continue to have a strong um, level of climate diplomacy. Um, I agree with Edward that one of the main things that we are hopefully exporting um, or that countries look to us having done it well is the climate change bill and in particular the committee on climate change I think that legal process of setting uh, five-year targets in parliament is an incredibly good one um, and now obviously after post-brexit trade is the other the other um, another major angle uh, aid would be a third but I don't think that the UK is planning to be particularly strong on that at the moment, but that could be another way in which we could exercise um, diplomatic power on climate change. That's great. Thanks very much. OK, Andy, who's next? We've got another couple of questions. Okay, um, I'm going to bring Louise in to ask a question, who I'm just promoting now. And then we also have, and these are sort of two sort of linked to technology uh, questions. I'm also going to read out, let me find it, um, Philippa's question here. I've not managed to, man uh, to speak to on the chat. Just to say, if uh, do keep an eye, if you've submitted the question, do keep an eye on the chat because I'll message you and ask you to raise your hand. Um, so just, yeah, have a look at that. Um, I'll ask Louise to re re read the question in a sec. Um, but first, I will just read Philippa's. Um, so... Uh, I think it's mainly aimed at Ed. Um, it's, I know you discounted a ban on lamb, but when looking at it, oh, sorry, yeah, but when looking at it, how did the potential use of wool as an alternative material uh, compared to plastic-based material balance against the devastation sheep cause on biodiversity and, and potential land use uh, for direct human consumption crops? So that's uh, Philippa's question. And then Louise, uh, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I'm the... Uh 
lead on South Ross Council for uh, climate, the climate emergency. And this morning we had a briefing about South Gloss being part of a bid for um, a nuclear fusion project involving uh, the old Barclay and Oldbury power stations. So um, should I be supporting this or not? So two questions vaguely linked around the idea of various new technologies. Um, Jane, do you want to tackle those first? Um, I mean, if neither of you know anything about these particular technologies, don't feel you have to answer, but I'm sure you will have some comments. <laughs> Jane. Um, on, I, I know very little about nuclear fusion, I'm afraid. I think it's, uh, from what I know, it's quite far off. So it sounds like it would be a research project rather than a pilot, but I might be wrong. Um, I, don't, I don't really feel qualified to comment. Um, and sorry, Andy, summarise the other question for me. I, on Lam. Uh, Philippa's question. So um, how do you sort of balance the, uh, related to Ed's, Ed's point about um, the ban on LAM, um, looking at it, how, how does the, the, the potential use of wool as an alternative material uh, compared to plastic based material balance against devastation in sheep caused on biodiversity? Obviously not necessarily clean air related, but uh, I mean, yeah, obviously that's, linked. That is another very difficult one. Um, that I'm sure somebody somewhere has done a calculation for. It's what, like one of those, does does a, an electric vehicle um, mitigate the emissions produced in its production during its lifetime type questions? Uh, I think if you use it, if you're e gonna eat the lamb anyway, uh, the uh, the argument will be obviously that the wool, like we need to use the wool in various innovative ways, um, but I don't know what the, what the balance as if the sheep weren't going to be there in the first time I'm in a, um, anyway I'm afraid. That's okay we're trying not to um, uh, challenge our speakers too much with really specific uh, questions but we thought these were a couple of ones that might be worth trying. So Ed what would you like to say? Uh, on, on lamb yes I mean I, not um, I would imagine that the the damage outweighs the benefit but I would um, have to run a model to, uh, to answer. Um, but I, I mean, lambs, presumably, yes, they're, they're not generally producing much wool. I, I would imagine they give them poor, poor little things. They don't live very long, but um, kind of, uh, I mean, I think um, there has been quite a lot of fairly robust evidence that beef and lamb particularly, in terms of just straight up emissions, um, are disastrous. And in terms of biodiversity are disastrous as well. So you'd need an enormous amount of, um, of benefit on the positive side of savings from wool for sheep, shall we say, um, to get anything like a positive number out of it. Uh, Louise, uh, well, agreed. I mean, that, that old joke of nuclear fusions is it's always 30 years away from, um, oh. you know, a fruition. There is a, I'm, 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 I'm rather amazed to hear this, um, there is a huge um, 20, 30 odd billion pound, a euro, sorry, project on, on fusion going on in France, as far as I know, which I actually reference in the, my, my report. And I think if anything were to come out of fusion that would be of interest, it would probably come out of there. Um, so I'd be skeptical about nuclear fusion in, in Gloss, but you'd probably get some headlines for it if you went for it. Not necessarily favorable ones, but <laughs> quite interesting. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, and Thank you. I think it's John, yeah. Thanks, Louise. Great, yeah. Um, and, and just to say as well, John's um, added some uh, comments in the chat. Um, Louise might be caught in the ether here, so he might not actually see this but uh, uh, or hear this, but John's added some useful resources in the chat around around that point and that question. Uh, and speaking of John, I'm going to bring John in to ask uh, ask his question now. He might have, I think there's a couple, actually. So, John, you put three questions, I think, in, and we thought we were all really rather good. So feel free to ask all of them, but as, as quickly okay. as we're about to run out of time. I, I'll, I might stick to one if that's all right, on the, on the spirit of running out of time. I, I, so I guess my, my real question is, what, what are you most excited about in, in, that you see around the world? Like, where do you think, if, we, if we're on a path to where we need transformative change, and I don't disagree with that, like, I find it a little bit kind of disheartening to be to be sat in sort of the numbers and the kind of the megatons and the whatever and, and, and a bit more kind of exciting and empowering and maybe, maybe this is a nice place to have a last question of like what, what's what's going on in the world that makes you go come on more of that 
uh, where do you look and where do you where do you where do you turn away and go great and and like it's for me for me just to share like I think the what's going on in France at the moment off the back of the Convention Citoyenne I mean Jane Ed you both mentioned deliberative democracy but the way that process has basically created a it looks like it's creating something that might transform French politics from from top to bottom actually like the, the, the participants in that assembly now seem to actually be forming the next political movement in France uh, because they were given that power and that to me says like when people feel and are given agency and they step into that then they start to want to take more take more of it and do more with it so so that would be my one so I'm looking for kind of where do you point to in the world and go I want that one I'd love to hear Duncan's as well actually and maybe even Andy's. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Um, let's take it's a great question. So let's take that. And then I think we've got time just for a couple of last ones. Um, so Ed, do you want to go with this one? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, thanks, John. Yeah, and, and I, I agree that what's going on in France is interesting, not least in the way that I feel that the sadly the initial phases were very poorly handled by the government and they're getting serious pushback on it, which is which is very positive. And then some, some, somewhat hopeful for, for, for what we could do here potentially. But um, um, I mean, it, 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 it's still pretty amazing to see what's being done in the world of solar and PV and micro generation. Uh, I mean, I know this is now something that we have, I mean, like no, none of us, no matter where you are on technology, could disagree that we need full on, full, full, full fat deployment of solar and wind and we need to decarbonize the power sector ASAP. That is a would now be considered a mature technology and it uh, it is still fairly amazing what they've been able to do to reduce the um the generation costs etc and what they're able to do in uh in developing countries as well um um I, there are some developments in I mean, this is a dull answer i suppose but there are some developments in finance in the world of um you know there, there, there's a good side to esg so environmental social governance um style of reporting and there's a good side, I think, to some of the work that's being done on more innovative um, financing, monetary policy, et cetera, um, which, because we just need to deploy so much capital, um, could actually be a game changer if the mindset shifts enough to, be, to enable it to happen. Um, I go through phases by think, from thinking that people like Mark Carney, him particularly, are doing a great thing and then think he's doing a dreadful thing. But... You know that he is doing it is perhaps a good thing and we'll see um you know so yeah i mean i would say yeah that the energy revolution and um and uh and to some extent some of the moves that have been made in finance yeah so i i still find it amazing to pick up the ft and see so much climate change in it I, I, that just wouldn't have been the case even what two years ago i don't think so possible yeah, that's fair enough uh, um, oh sorry ed, you've, ed, you'd finish. oh yes no, what the, what the the second question, sorry. Um, what, Carry on, yeah, beg your pardon. You know, what was the second question? I've actually, sorry, I haven't, participatory, I haven't participatory democracy, wasn't it? And it's... Uh, I didn't actually ask a second question, Duncan. I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I think I think that you'd already dealt with deliberative. I, I just oh, asked... Yeah. Well, no, I am, I am cheered, very cheered by what's going on in France. And I, I followed as much as I could the, the Climate Assembly in the UK as well. And I thought, you know, it was a very interesting exercise. Gotcha. Jane, what's the most exciting change you've seen? Um, can I have two? <laughs> I've got, I mean, the thing that I've got a thing that most inspires me, and I think the thing, and a different thing that I think is uh, is the the most exciting change happening now. Um, so the thing, the thing that most inspires me is um, I've seen, uh, I have the pleasure of meeting uh, many doctors in India that have taken on air quality and climate change as their issue. Um, they've st they started by measuring pollution around their hospitals and because they're scientists they can do that really well and in ways that um, can't be refuted by the courts. Uh, one of them, a hospital doctor, then went and testified against a local a uh, new coal-fired power plant, which is quite a dangerous thing to do as an individual. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've met this amazingly inspirational doctor, Dr. Kumar, who's a, been a lung surgeon for 30 years and has is now, you know, he tells the story of how he's now seeing um, people coming into his surgery with advanced lung cancer that have never smoked. They've never lived with a smoker, but effectively they have been smoking their entire lives because they've grown up in Delhi. 
and the, the you know, these these doctors have got an incredibly difficult day job I can imagine it is not easy being a lung surgeon um even if you're in one of Delhi's better equipped hospitals um and they're you know they're really taking this on and in their spare time doing everything that they can to reduce greenhouse gases and pollution in India so that's that's what most inspires me um that's not a, an emission reducing project I think the um the, the one of the things I'm most excited about uh, a change that's happening is how far mayors and city leaders are just taking this on for themselves, including in countries that have a lot lar largely have an absence of national contributions. Um, and I think that that is like local leadership is where I see uh, climate leadership mostly coming from. Great, thanks very much. Um, John, you invited me to comment as well, so I will do. Um, I actually think um, what Ed said is quite right. The um, just the speed of development of uh, new technologies like wind and solar, and the rate at which the costs have come down dramatically. And I think it's, you know, we're used to living in a world where government gets where our government gets most things wrong. Certainly, over the last few years, um, there are a few examples of where governments can get things right. And I think I'm also, I mean, that is coupled with, uh, I mean, Ed was sort of fairly sceptical about the ability of technology to solve all our problems. And that's quite right, of course. But I think I'm perhaps slightly more of a technology optimist. I think once you unleash industrial innovation, it can go a very long way in solving problems much faster and much more effectively than you thought they had. One of the first things I worked on as a researcher at Chatham House was the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substances. And that problem has basically been solved in a way that nobody ever thought it was possible to at the beginning. Now, you can't assume that'll all happen by itself. You have to have really active government to point industry and researchers and scientists and so on in the right direction and create the policy framework that means that doing the right thing is rewarded. And actually, of course, remember one of the, the main reasons why solar and wind are so much more uh, cheaper and being taken up so fast in the UK today is because of the policy framework we put in place when we were in government and coalition. So I think there's a good example of where government can steer industry and innovation in the right direction if they get the policy signals and the funding right. And you can achieve perhaps more than you thought um, you could start with. And that's, I think, a really optimistic thing. It won't solve all the problems, I agree, but I think it, you can solve a lot of them that way. Andy, do you want to come in with your um, uh, most exciting change observation? I think I, I, I think in terms of most exciting, I'd say it probably links back to the the, the participatory democracy angle that John was on one of one one of John's other questions. Um, and I think the exciting thing for me about that is is that whilst I guess Ed, you were talking about how the the kind of emerging technology is is taking 30, 40 years to, to have a direct impact on um, on emissions and on, on you know on, on the climate. Um, the, the advances in technology that are kind of completely separate to uh, to, to, to climate change in, in things like you know communications and and uh, platforms we're seeing emerging are making a lot more of that stuff far more possible. So we're like we're seeing far more um, examples of participatory democracy happening, not just in you know pre-COVID times, but but there's lots of stuff going on you know in in uh, in the past year as well with with kind of online assemblies and things like that happening, which is which is really exciting as well. And hopefully. That's something that we can we see kind of take off further and further. That's great. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for the questions. Um, so we've got time for just two more questions. So next is James Mullen. I think Andy, you're going to read out his question. Yes, and apologies, I have to take a second. I have to scroll back through <laughs> uh, to make sure yes. I find it because I, I I asked for a slightly shorter version of the question because it was a it was a bit longer for me to regurgitate on uh, from the Q and A, but I've got that here. So. Um, how do we encourage consumers to take ownership of the problem, agreeing to stop flying, agreeing to take on a vegan diet, things like that, um, rather than abdicating responsibility to governments to solve the issues for us? So we sort of touched on this a little bit to start with, but um, Jane, do you want to um, add any comments? Um, well, I think that the... Um... I don't know whether I, I <laughs> am the right person to answer this question because I think that the because I believe in the power of a good good legislation and good policy to make it the biggest possible difference. I would say that um, 
the major difference people can make is voting for the party that has the most ambitious <laughs> policy and uh, in the absence of having that party in government doing something as well, doing whatever they can to get the right policies through at the right time. So whilst I'm on this subject, my um, my particular call to action for you all at the minute would be the Environment Bill is about to start going through back through Parliament shortly. It's been halted a few times because of COVID. Um, and there's quite a lot of important stuff in there because obviously we've now got a blank sheet of paper where our uh, European environmental legislation used to be. So um, yeah, please pay attention to that and write to your MP if you can about um, getting in particular World Health Organization air quality limits into law, but also um, an independent body, a lot like the Committee on Climate Change, a watchdog to make sure that all environmental targets are um, all the government's held to account for setting and meeting them. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Ed. Um, it's it's always a hard question, and it, it's particularly pertinent for, um, for for people that consider themselves to be liberal. Um, I I do I have to say I agree with pretty much everything James just said, but I but I also um, I would say that I think you know bringing people into the debate um, so they understand the scale of the crisis without scaring them, but but getting them getting them properly briefed on that is something we still haven't properly done. I, I know there's been a real desire to avoid. Some of that because we worry that we put people off. I think Jane is absolutely right again that tangible things like air pollution that do affect people's lives very, very directly are very obvious in, in you know, you know, roads in, uh, and, and 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 clearly you're having a lot of success in that area, but it's a very big problem. Um, I do think that I mean, there's some obvious things we could start doing. I mean, that, our, our tax system does not, I mean, just doesn't work properly in terms of incentivizing environmentalism and, and, and de incentivizing dirty problematic things. I mean, we got into some of this in the climate paper. And I think, you know, there were uh, pro pro uh, pro proposals made about VAT rates and green VAT rates, etc. And, you know, we, we'd be pushing on, a, on an open door there. I mean, really, that's crazy. I mean, we're also still highly, heavily subsidizing gas, really, whereas we're not subsidizing clean electricity. And when you're trying to switch to a heat pump or getting people to switch, it's quite a big part of the the, uh, the economic proposition is the fact that it's basically cheaper in terms of your tax to put a you know, sort of fossil fuel in your boiler rather than have a clean, a clean electricity. So there are some, there are some quick wins for a, for a smart treasury um, with a five-year horizon um, to do, which we've, I think, actually gone quite a long way to making proposals in, um, you know, uh, there. And then, and then you get into this thorny question of a straight up carbon tax or applying the carbon price to consumer goods, which, you know, they've got into with France in France a bit and got into a bit of trouble there. But I think, you know, we've got to have, have not, possibly have another go. But um, yeah, it's not an easy one. And, you know, um, further discussion. Great. Well, um, for those of you who will be at Autumn Conference, um, all being well, we hope there will be a policy paper on carbon pricing, in fact. So you have the chance for exactly that discussion and debate. Um, now, um, we are rather over time for this, so we need to bring us to a close. And we have the classic, um, really short, snappy question at the end. Feel free to answer any way you like. But Andy, you're going to tell us Mark Johnston's question. Yes, uh, thanks, Duncan. Question is to both speakers, do you feel you are a pessimist or an optimist and why? Ed. I... I suppose I would have to just pull the old, is it Gramsci or whomever, the, the, the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will nonsense that we hear so much. But I, you know, I, 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 I do have to say, I think, you know, we are facing difficult times. Um, when I see the, when I see the UN reports and I see the, what they said about the, 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 the NDC, sorry, the national, the, the country commitments the other day, and they admittedly only have had about what is it a third of them submitted on time, um, but they they amount to something like was it two percent of emissions required rather than the forty five percent that's needed. And I, yeah, my heart sinks when I see things like that. Um, but you know, we're a, we're a resourceful lot. We're I'm I'm a, I'm still a, a very much a heart of liberal, so I believe in innovation. I believe in you know extraordinary acts of you know of individual and collective courage and, and genius. So I still think, why not? Let's do it. Uh, so yes, still in the optimist camp. Excellent. Thanks very much. Jane. Um, yeah, well, I think the same. I um, There's a huge, there's a huge distance to travel, but 
you know, if COVID has sh- and the response to COVID has shown us anything, it's that when the shit hits the fan, we actually do all pull together and <laughs> make things happen. Um, and I think a lot of innovations, a lot of community work, new policies, new ways of life have emerged in a much shorter time than we ever could have imagined. So um, I, I, I can't imagine a future where that does not happen for climate change. So an ultimate optimist. Excellent. Thanks very much. It's a great note on which to finish. Um, we could go on for hours, um, but uh, we need to dr- draw this meeting to a close. Thank you to everyone who put questions and uh, sorry for those we didn't have time to call. Thank you for all of you for participating. But thanks particularly to Jane and Ed as our two speakers. Uh, as I said, Ed's booklet is available on the SLF website. It's well worth a read. Um, the next two SLF meetings are at conference, spring conference next weekend, and then the one after that is on the 29th of March on UBI, and I think Chris uh, put the information in the chat, sort of, you need to scroll up a bit, but they're also available on the SLF website. And thank you very much indeed to Andy Galloway for um, coping with all the Q&A, and thank you to the SLF for hosting it. Thanks to all of you, and I hope to see you at future meetings. <laughs>